On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Merle. And Merle was in a physically abusive relationship with a controlling Rambo. It's a story of trauma bonds, jealousy, the fog, AA, triangulation, and stalking. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Merle. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. And if you want to be a guest like Merle is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com and click on the guest form button that is at the top of the page. There you can read all of our instructions and please read them all and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out the guest form and press the submit button and please do send it in the format that we ask for. And there is a content warning for this episode as we do graphically discuss physical abuse, sexual assault, and suicidal ideation. So that is your content warning for today. And also today, a slight warning on some background noise for some people that don't like some background noise. Due to an upstairs neighbor above Merle, they might be rolling around on a chair here and there. I think I tried to cut most of it out, but I wasn't able to get all of it. But that might be there and it might annoy some of you. So... Please don't give us a bad review. We couldn't avoid it. And today you're going to hear Merle's story. And Merle was in a very scary relationship. And I would consider them to be a Rambo on Lundy Bancroft's abuser types from Why Does He Do That? And I can't thank Merle enough uh, for being here to discuss the trauma. She's been through a very, very, very difficult time. Time and it's just a really not an easy thing to do when you're going through such a trauma with the, the physical abuse and, and stalking that went on as well. So a big thank you to Merle for being here. And now I'm going to get out of my way in your way. Merle, the floor is now yours. So I'll start off by saying a little bit about my childhood. I um, grew up in England and I grew up with a quite dysfunctional childhood um my dad was a workaholic and a very intelligent man but also a very abusive man and my mom did her best to be a good mom but they they got married when she was very young and I have a sister also and growing up was pretty difficult um my dad was uh, physically abusive to my mom and I don't want to say it just happened a few times because that's no you know I'm not excusing it but there was um I guess there were a few incidents where he did hit her but he was always very good at hiding it um and my mom had grown up in an abuse uh both her parents were alcoholics but she grew up uh, like in a really wealthy um family so it kind of wasn't um ever talked about it was kind of like brushed over because uh it was just sort of like well why would somebody like that have it hard um so my mom wasn't very good at setting boundaries and I actually didn't know what a boundary was until I was like 30 (laughs) <laughs> and I've heard other people talk about that and, and I feel it's true. I, I really didn't know what boundaries were. So, yeah, unfortunately, there was sexual abuse growing up and that was very difficult dealing with that. And just, yeah, that was very hard. And my sister and I were both, yeah, well, I won't talk about my sister, but yeah, basically it was very difficult. And um my mom decided to leave when when I was around six years old. She had enough of the abuse and she left. I don't really remember the day she left, but apparently my dad scooped me and my sister up and drove us to the train station and my mom was boarding it to go to London. And apparently I was just waving saying, oh, choo-choo train, because I didn't know what was going on. 
And my mom left for about a year and a half. She would come back at weekends, not every weekend, but she would come back maybe once a month. And I don't really remember that time, if I'm honest. Um, It's a little bit of a blur, but I do remember having a nanny and she wasn't that nice. She was very old school English, very strict. Uh, She would hit us. Just very, I don't know, just not a very nice person. And my mom came back and then eventually she got divorced from my dad. It took about seven years for the divorce to go through because my dad was playing games and and just just making our lives an absolute nightmare. Um, we were sort of moving around the place, living in different houses, rented accommodation. It was, yeah, it was very disrupted the childhood and uh, I really didn't want anything to do with my dad Um, he was the one who abused me and I remember actually confronting him at the age of I don't know uh, well I actually my friend and I was screaming in the in the swimming pool when we were younger and um, calling him a pervert and the police came Um, but unfortunately they didn't interview us they just took my dad's word for it but her mother told my mum that she didn't want my friend to see me anymore because of what happened. So my mum had confronted my dad and he, of course, denied everything. Um, but, yeah, I never got any justice for that, which is kind of annoying. Um, but I guess that's, yeah, that was my childhood. Um, and And I ended up going to New York for a little bit for drama school and then I came back to London met my husband moved to LA and it was in LA that I met my abuser so before we get to the meeting of your abuser what were some issues that were created from your childhood that hindered you you know, as you became an adult, did you have low self-esteem? Did you have like an anxious attachment style, an avoidant attachment style? Were you a people pleaser, a fixer, things along those lines at all? I was always, I was always attracted to the opposites, which I say the opposite of my dad. My dad was like a very successful businessman, very on the outside, you know, well-to-do, wealthy. Uh, he had a business, incredibly intelligent, but obviously just evil. And so I was always attracted to opposites of that because I didn't want anything to do with somebody like that. But ironically, <laughs> I would still go for abusive men and um, and that's what happened. But my I'm fiercely independent, which I think attracts those kind of men because they think they can tame you um, or they think they can, you know, dominate you. I, I guess I'm seen, you know, as a little bit, as a, it's a bit like a chasing, chasing a horse or something. You just want to sort of, or they wanted to just kind of grab me and make me submit to them. But um, yeah, definitely. Um, hyper independent and I think that's probably for my mum leaving me I think I'm definitely hyper independent and I don't know whether maybe I do have low self-esteem and I'm just not aware of it but I think I I always want to help people I always want to see the best in people and when somebody gives me a sob story that I can relate to I guess that they mirror something to me then you know, I, I sort of feel like we're kindred spirits. And then I think that's really what happened in the beginning of this relationship. Yeah. So is it fair to say that when you have a partner, you're like, we're a team and, you know, you believe in that team no matter what. And if someone is falling behind, you're going to pick them up and you would expect the same from someone else yeah it was definitely 
I think in my marriage as well, it was definitely, I saw it as we were a team, the two of us against the world kind of thing. We could make this work. And um, I definitely, I definitely see relationships like that. I hate to say that I I think you're stronger as a pair because you're not. I, I realize now I'm actually quite fine, but definitely back then I thought that I had to have a partner to sort of balance me out or, you know, we would both lift each other up um, and work through things together. So because of your mom leaving, there is this hyper independence where you don't need anyone. You're, you're good on your own, but at the same time, there's the other side of the coin, which is you didn't have that growing up. There was no family kind of cohesiveness growing up. So in a way, that idea of having that and having someone like that is important, even though you are also independent. But finding someone for you would be finding someone who's also very independent and, and, and gets you would probably yes. be like the best match. Yeah. And, and I think, oh, I thought I, I'd found those two. So when I, when I met my husband, we had a similar, you know, career wise, we were very similar. We had similar um, aspirations and well, kindred spirits, I guess, but the marriage didn't work. We moved to the city for our careers. Uh, it was a city in America uh, creative city and um unfortunately the marriage didn't go very well and there was alcoholism involved and I just was not happy in the marriage at all in fact it would it was seven years and the the last two years were just hell there's no fun being uh married to an alcoholic it's just really it's it's awful and he wasn't a bad person but he just wasn't a good partner. And it became like, you know, it just became a, a marriage of convenience. And I was pretty much, I felt like I was doing a lot more. There was absolutely no sexual interest on my part whatsoever. And I think there was no interest on his either. We were just like roommates. And I felt like it was like a roommate that I wanted to kick out. Like I didn't want this roommate anymore. and. I was starting to look at men. I had never looked at other men at all in my marriage, but it was the first time that I started to actually look. Not, I don't know, not, it wasn't like I was searching for somebody else, but it was like my eyes started to open and I would notice a good looking guy where if somebody smiled at me, I'd be like, oh, I think you might be interested. And I had this wave of guilt. But at the same time, I had this resentment against my husband. I thought, no, you know, he's 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 treating me like absolute crap. And there didn't seem to be any future. It, it almost like just ran out of gas. And I started working at a restaurant and I was kind of happy in this new city. We had moved. My husband wasn't happy. He wanted to leave and go to another city, but I was not going to do that because I put down all of my savings and we both agreed to give it a shot. And he was sort of backing out early and I felt really resentful about that. So I was happy in this new place. I had some friends. I was sort of working towards my career. I felt like things were going well. And I met this guy at work. He was also working at the restaurant and I knew really early on that it was not a good idea uh, to be working with him because there was just this undeniable sexual attraction and he definitely wasn't particularly my type. He was covered in tattoos, um, but not that I care I mean I like tattoos but he was really covered in tattoos and into heavy metal like music like there were, we had massive differences culturally there was massive differences but opposites attract I guess and there was yeah there was just this um unbelievable chemistry and 
when we were working, one of our colleagues said to uh, said to me that this this guy uh, found me quite attractive, and of course that just set something off inside of me, and um, and I, you know, it was really difficult. And I, for the first few months, I tried to ignore it, tried to ignore it, but then I'd go back home, and my husband would be drunk um, on the sofa. And I would just, yeah, I, was just, I was just think this is so depressing. This isn't going anywhere. So eventually I told my husband that I, I wanted a divorce, that I was not happy. And um, I kind of gave myself this freedom that having admitted to my husband and myself that I was out of this marriage, that it gave me some freedom or gave me the license to go and do my own thing. And literally the next day, I spent the entire day with this guy from work. And it was just like a relief, but also I just felt like I was 16 again. You know, the just the excitement of being with somebody and having this, what I thought was amazing connection. And we'd had this sort of build up of like it, what, turned out to be I guess about four or five months of just chatting and flirting and and then obviously when we had sex it was it all you know they always say the sex is amazing and it was it was amazing um maybe because I hadn't had sex in so long I was like wow this is fantastic um but yeah unfortunately that I didn't kind of look at the red flags when I should have done and I was completely blinded by the honeymoon stage because there were definite red flags um one being that he was also in AA now my ex-husband only went to AA once it wasn't for him but here was this guy who admitted he was an alcoholic he owned it he was in AA he was in the program he was on his way to um he was at trade school to become um, a professional in a certain trade he had like a whole um, plan and there was also another sort of nagging issue um, I was 35 when I met him and I suddenly had this overwhelming desire to have a child like I'd never had that with my ex-husband ever but with this guy I wanted a child I just can't explain it it was a you know Something was, I guess it's just a, a, a female thing that happens in our body, hormones. And um, he really played on that. And he would, uh, you know, sort of dangle things and, and say, I, you know, I, I, I'd love to have a kid with you. And it was, yeah, it was, it was just not good. But anyway, uh, there was massive red flag. So there was that. There was also another massive red flag. Um, he had told me that a year prior, he had um, relapsed at his former job where he got fired. And there was a breathalyzer in his car. And again, I knew that didn't sound good. I knew that was not a good sign. And I had a gut feeling, do not carry on seeing this guy. But he always had an answer for everything. He was so good at uh, telling, you know, telling me that um, he, you know, now is, now he's completely different. He was incredibly good at um, lying. So the relationship picked up speed very quickly. Um, when I, well, when my husband left, I had to move out, find another place to live. And um, again, my ex-abuser was amazing. At that point, he helped me move. He was helping with my animals. And I do want to say that one thing that really hooked me was that how good he was with my animals. Um, he he just seemed, yeah, he seemed to love them and care for them and help me out quite a lot. Um, and that really played on my played on my heartstrings because to me, they're the most important, you know, they're my family. And he knew that. So we, I moved into a new place and very quickly he sort of infiltrated that space within, I, within the first week, he was like, 
you know, oh, do you mind if I leave a T-shirt here, a toothbrush, and then a pair of shoes? And before I knew it, he had a shelf. And he was living somewhere else and staying, um, well, turned out he was staying with a guy from the restaurant. He actually didn't really, I mean, he had a room there, but now looking back, he was a bit like a nomad. He didn't own anything. And he was a little older than me. He was, um, you know, almost 10 years older than me. And I was thinking, thinking back, I'm like, God, he didn't own anything other than a TV and a car. That's another red flag. But at the time, I just thought he was, you know, a free spirit and he had fallen on hard times. But now he was on, you know, the road to sort of making something of himself. Um, and he mirrored everything. Everything I was looking for that I didn't have in my husband, he was that person. Um, so it just seemed like a really good thing. I mean, it felt like I was sort of like this could be somebody that I could I felt like I'd met my soulmate. And when it comes to his childhood and everything that he had been through, what was his childhood like? What was his life like before, you know, you met him? One thing that he really hopped on about early on in our relationship was how he hated his parents. They were Catholic. They had come from Mexico um, to to the city that we lived in and he you know his dad had always worked really hard uh did everything by the book his mom had never learned a word of English she refused to speak English and that always upset my ex because he had to always translate for her and speak you know speak for her essentially and culturally there was some difficult um adjustments um they wanted him to go to church all the time so he went sort of from like this catholic you know very sort of uh strict family to being an absolute rebel apparently he was kicked out of home when he was like 15 um and sort of got into the music scene and got his body completely covered in tattoos and kind of completely rebelled against um i guess the stereotype of his you know of what he felt his culture was and uh but yeah there was always stories he would always tell me stories about you know how his dad was really cruel to his mother and how he always stuck up to his for his mom and how he felt that his dad was a bit abusive to her um which is interesting now because um the apple doesn't fall far from the tree um but the the thing that got me was when we first got together it was um yeah, it, it really played on my on uh, on, I guess my heartstrings because I I saw you know here's a guy we've both been through quite a lot of stuff childhood you know not great childhoods and um and yes he's fallen on a hard times but who am I to judge because I've not been you know I haven't been perfect in my past my marriage fell apart there must be something wrong with me um and yeah I kind of wanted to maybe I wanted to fix him. Maybe I wanted us to make it work, you know, us against the world. I don't know. But um, yeah, it, it, it definitely started to take a bit of a nosedive. And that happened pretty soon in actually. So when he started to sort of move his things into my apartment, my new uh, landlady was not happy about this dynamic. It was supposed to be an only single occupancy rent situation. It was sort of in a back house and um, she didn't want him there. And rather than him saying, okay, I'll set mine a little bit. Let's just let things cool down. He became very um, combative and he would sort of be like the little monkey on my shoulder And sort of say, well, you're the one who's paying rent. Don't let her bully you. Don't do this. You know, you should be able to have your friends over and boyfriend over. And and so I sort of, sort of fighting, you know, started fighting back. And, but I wasn't comfortable with the situation either. I actually didn't want him there as much. Um, But I, I don't know why I just didn't put boundaries down. But again, I wasn't very good at putting boundaries down back then. I never got taught what boundaries were. And I, I sort of just took his word for it all the time. He got me into so much trouble because I took his word for it on so many, so many different things. 
but um yeah basically um very soon after um i one thing that he did do which was uh i guess this should be like a like a warning <laughs> a uh trigger warning but um because we had great sex i was very like you know i was very sort of happy with with him touching me and being around him however uh one night i woke up to him having sex with me and that really made me freeze because not only had we never discussed that um he also sort of and i was angry actually when it happened i was really upset and he played it off as uh, something called zombie sex and i spent ages googling this i was like what the hell is zombie sex i would love somebody to tell me if they know what it was but i just think it was just looking back i think it was a whole load of crap um but he had this sort of comeback and he made me feel that i was uh ignorant or naive for not knowing what it was um and the next morning i sort of said to him again i was like i'm not happy that you did that it's not okay and I spoke to a few of my friends and they sort of had mixed feelings about it. And I always think it's a bit dangerous when you speak to your friends because sometimes they don't give great advice. And um, one of my friends said, well, you're in a relationship. So, you know, it's it's not really, you know, it's nothing. It's not like it's rape or anything. But actually, yeah, it is. If you're not giving consent and someone is climbing on top of you in the middle of the night, yeah, it's rape. Um and it happened a few more times after that, but I was so angry that he stopped doing it. And I also want to point out that he would pretend that he was asleep while he did it. So again, he had all these excuses. Um, my landlady was getting really annoyed uh, with me being there and I was, uh, it was getting very heated and, um, and I was really worried that I was going to lose my apartment. And uh, he talked about, listen, why don't we just get somewhere together? And I also want to add that I was really struggling financially. I didn't have any family around me. Um, I was working in a restaurant. The city that I live in is really expensive and I was struggling to pay rent. And even though this guy was living with me most of the time, he did not offer to pay anything even when i mentioned it to him and said i think you should chip in for stuff he would you know buy buy dinner occasionally or or you know drive me around if i needed to get groceries or pick up the grocery bills but he he never paid any rent um so we ended up moving in together three months after being like i guess an item and the first day i moved in despite the fact that we'd found a really cute place and the area was really nice. I just remember calling one of my best friends and saying, oh my God, I've made a big mistake. I just knew in my, in my gut, I knew I'd made a huge mistake. And it, I, although I make it sound like, you know, when we were together with, with the, with the, basically with the rape, that, it, that it was all horrendous. There was also these amazing times where he was, super encouraging about my career he was super supportive he was like championing me you know and I felt like I had this massive support he was always wanting to do fun things and show me the city that he was from there were so many great things or what I thought were great things in the beginning and that masked all the all the sort of uh, massive red flags and the abuse that had already happened and the first time before we moved in, I do want to add that there was a verbal uh, altercation, which was another red flag um, at work. He, he sort of, we were all joking around and, and I, I guess, well, he said I was pushing it and he just turned on me and just called me every name under the sun. You know, you fucking bits, you're, you're C-U-N-T, like everything. And it just came out of nowhere. And the look on his face when he just, when he snapped was terrifying, but it was also, he was relentless. Even though I went to the bathroom, I was crying. I was so upset and I had to go back out and work at the restaurant. I had to pull myself together and just try and get over it. But he sort of shadowed me around the restaurant. And whenever, you know, we were out of sight of the, the people, 
he he you know he continued to call me this call me horrible names and insult me and sort of really goad me like why are you crying why are you making it about yourself it was horrible and um I think he knew that I was ready to sort of like dump him and he sort of you know bought me flowers the next day and all this sort of stuff and you know the amazing guy sort of came back and he just slipped and you know he was just insulted and again it's a culture thing that I don't understand and I had embarrassed him and so I ended up apologizing I thought god I did probably embarrass him and sometimes I can you know push it a little bit far with people and I overstep you know I pushed it too far I wasn't thinking about him I was just thinking about getting a laugh so anyway we moved in together I knew there was something deeply wrong but he was actually pretty good in the beginning he was very accommodating with uh with me putting all my stuff up and you know to be fair I hated his I hated his stuff it was all like these skulls and oh god it was awful but I was trying to embrace our differences but I was like this is terrible so to be fair he did let me or he gave me the illusion that I was like allowed to do what I wanted in the flat and um things were going well they were going well like for a while for a little while and um I ended up um looking for another job because I realized that it wasn't very healthy that we were working together and living together and I also wanted to earn some more money and I wanted a little bit of my own independence because I had noticed that he was quite he wasn't clingy, but he was incredibly always checking in. Text messages, and, hey, where are you? What are you doing? In the beginning, I thought, oh, this is really nice. He really cares. Um, but I also thought, you know what? I'm quite an independent person. I do need my own space. So I ended up getting another job as a nanny. And my boss was, was male. Um, and that didn't go down too well. My ex was convinced that I was having an affair with him. And it start, this started off slowly with little, you know, comments about maybe if I wore a dress or if I had some makeup on. And the comments just escalated and it was exhausting. It was constantly, you know, constantly just, it, just the, the jealousy was extremely tiring. and. Um, we decided to take a little break to, uh, to the mountains for Thanksgiving, me and my partner. And it was sort of a, a way to, I don't know, like I said, I was earning a little bit more money and I wanted to have a nice Thanksgiving with my partner. And, and like I said, things were going okay, but I don't know, the jealousy was, was starting to become a bit of an issue, but it was when we were away that the sort of first, I guess, physical altercation happened. And again, this was, it started off great. And this is what's so frustrating about the whole relationship when I look back at it. You know, the weekend started off fantastically. We, we went up to the mountains. It was snowing. We had the animals with us. Um, And when we got to the cabin, it was amazing. It was perfect. You know, it was like a little cabin with everything we needed. We had stuff for Thanksgiving. I made us like food. Um, It was great. But weirdly, that night, the only channel that worked was a channel that played repeats of forensic files, which was weird. Um, But, you know, I like forensic files. He liked forensic files. So we just sort of ended up watching the whole, you know, Thanksgiving, just watching forensic files the whole day. It was weird. But the next morning, it was incredibly, incredibly cold and the uh, electricity had been cut out. It was such a big snowstorm that one of the, you know, the power cables, whatever, had come down. And I knew that we had to leave. There's no way we could stay. I mean, it was dangerously cold. We couldn't stay another night there. And it took hours to dig the car out. It was so buried in snow. And despite the fact it was, you know, 
beautiful blue day, uh, blue sky, it was freezing. So he wanted to go and get a sandwich or he wanted to go and get some food. So we had chains on the car. We drove to literally uh, less than a mile down the road and there was um, like a, a store that had a generator. So they were open. And suddenly he just turned and we went so from, again, working as a team to suddenly him being in a massive mood. He was so upset so angry and that the weekend was destroyed and everything was shit which was strange because I thought we had had sort of a good night but you know it's prematurely cut short so I got coffee I sat in the car he decided to go and get himself some food he was in that supermarket and it's a small store it wasn't even a supermarket he was in there for about 40 minutes I was in the car freezing with my dog and um he comes out with just one sandwich for himself and uh, sits down and starts to eat it. And then he said, oh, do you want a bite? And I had a bite of it and there were beans in it. And I made a joke about beans in a sandwich where, you know, I don't have beans in sandwiches in England. We do beans on toast. We don't do, I don't, well, I guess it's a sandwich, but it, it was just a lighthearted joke. And out of nowhere, he just throws the sandwich in my face and like smacks it in my face. And all this mayonnaise and like beans and everything's just dripping down my face and it falls on my dog. And, um, and I was just so, I was just like, it was just humiliating and shocking. And I was, I was enraged and I said, I'm going to call the police. That's it. I'm done. And I opened the door and he just whipped around and suddenly he was literally over me. He would not let me out of his sight. And he, it was like he was about 30 millimeters from my head. And it didn't matter where I walked or, or if I raised my voice, he was just there. And I sort of had this standoff with him. And I sort of waited around for about 20 minutes. But I had my dog with me. I was trying to walk around so she wasn't getting cold. And then the reality of we've only got one car. I'm freezing. I need to get out of here with my animals. And there's no way I can drive by myself with with chains and in this kind of condition. It was like, you know, it was bad. So we went back, got the animals, we drove out. And on the way down, he called his sponsor. And his sponsor had been quite a presence in our relationship. Um, I'd been to a few AA meetings with him and met the sponsor. And he was just so... Um, it was like a therapist who I didn't realize we, we'd hired. And he was always just chipping in, you know, um, these calls that he would do with him, I guess, the check-ins that you do with your um, sponsor. But it was really um, invasive. And rather than this guy saying, listen, I don't know what happened with the sandwich, but you, maybe you guys need to go to proper therapy. And said this guy sort of said that I was immature for making this bean joke and that he just overreacted. And so it was excused. That behavior was just suddenly excused. Um, and again, I felt like I had behaved badly, even though I knew it was wrong. I'd had, you know, him and a few of his friends sort of chime in that actually, you know, and another thing he was very great at doing is he would sort of bring it up again. Or if I brought it up, he'd say, well, actually, I spoke to a few friends. And they said that what you did was really like, you know, manipulative or what you did was not, or what you said was really uh, cruel. And they think that what I did was actually just acting in defense, you know? So, and I I didn't really talk to my friends about it because I was embarrassed. I mean, I know how it sounds. um, So I didn't really say anything to anyone. Um, I just kept it quiet because I told all my friends that I met this amazing guy who was, who was my soulmate. And then suddenly I'm thinking, oh God, this guy's terrible. Or this guy has like these really bad outbursts of anger. And I, I felt ashamed and I didn't want to tell people about it. So I didn't. Um, anyway, when we got back, he, he decided to go to more AA meetings. That was another thing that he would do. 
So when there were these episodes where he acted out, uh, he would tell me that it was actually because of me that he acted out because that he was spending more time with me and I was keeping him from his AA meetings. Therefore, it was sort of my fault. Uh, just nuts. And um, But when he did go to more meetings, when he did go to the gym more, when he did exactly what he wanted to do, he was a nicer person. He was nicer to me. And that's what started to happen into our relationship because I wanted him to, to stay the nice guy. I completely worked around his schedule. I would see my friends only when the nights that he was free. And this didn't happen right away, but you know, eventually over time it starts to happen this way. Um, and I would miss out on things. I would miss out my yeah, you know, my classes or or seeing my friends sometimes because it was the only night that he was free. Um God knows what he was doing. I mean, I'm sure he was like seeing like, I'm sure he must have been flirting with girls because that was another thing he did throughout of our relationship. He would always introduce me to these women and they were always friends. Oh, this is so-and-so, an AA group. You know, she's a single mom and she's really nice. And at the time, I just thought, oh, he's a really, you know, he's really caring about people. But Every woman that he introduced me to later, I realized that he had some sort of connection with or he was intimate with. Um, so he'd always have women on the go. There was always someone in the wing. Anyway, so things were like, things got, again, they got better. The cycle of abuse, things got so much better. We were doing really well. And um, it was Fortunately, the pandemic hit um, and things took a really bad turn around the pandemic. I was also pregnant and really happy. He was happy when, it, you know, when we first found out. Um, but unfortunately, he lost his job. Then I had to quit my job because the family that I was working for was so, so toxic. And they had exposed me to COVID knowingly. And this was when COVID first came out, when everybody was scared to even like, you know, eat a piece of fruit without washing it or scrubbing it with fairy liquid or washing up liquid. Like it was, you know, right at the, right the beginning. So before you continue, you glanced over, I'm pregnant, I was happy, he was happy. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, let's backtrack just to this pregnancy because a lot has happened in a very short amount of time with this person when you get pregnant and you say you're very happy. What are the whole entire thoughts going through your head at this point? Because there's a lot going on like, where do you think you are in your life at that time versus the reality of that? And I'm not blaming or being blaming or anything. Yeah. Just like, what is your thought process throughout this time? Well, I have to say also, and I kind of, I, I guess I, I forgot to mention this because I didn't mention it, but I, this was the second time I was pregnant. So the first time I was pregnant was literally right away when we first got together. Um, and in my head, well, not just in my head, it was a re it was really bad timing. I just come out of my marriage. Um, I was not ready. I, you know, I went into massive panic mode and he wasn't ready either. And, um, and I did get an abortion and it wasn't an easy decision. Um, but I decided that, well, we decided that it wasn't the right time. And I always felt really guilty about that because it's not an easy decision to make. And I, you know, I felt guilty that I did that. So when I fell pregnant the second time, I was really happy and I wanted this to work. And we were in a better place, um, even, you know, well, I didn't realize he was going to lose his job. Um, and I didn't really, it sort of happened, you know, it just happened around the pandemic it was bad timing, but 
Um, I was happy. Also, I wanted to add that um, we had spent more time with his parents and his parents had this sort of close to a back house as you can get in on their property. And we had been speaking uh, to them the year prior about building like a one like a one bedroom unit in that space it would it, you know it, it was easily easily accessible we could do it now they agreed to let us do it and in my mind I had sort of found a bit like a chicken I was like I, I found my nest like you know I was kind of nesting um things with us were better like you know I, in my mind as long as he need, he did what he had to do then then this could work. And again, I've got this guy who's amazing nurturing with my animals. You know, he, he was incredibly, incredibly good with my animals. And um, so there was that sort of delusion there. And I was really happy. And he was, I think, at the time, genuinely happy. But very quickly that turned south because his parents, when the pandemic pandemic happened his parents decided that they didn't want us to build uh the back house and we we've got an architect by the way to even go around and have a look at it um but they they actually didn't want to help us and that was a real shock um and of course he'd lost his job and i was now unemployed because i've walked out on my job because of the exposure to covid so it sort of did a one it just did a like 360 and I became incredibly depressed very quickly um I felt very isolated and um you know even going for a walk people crossing the street if I heard someone cough it was awful and I was hearing all these things about how you know women were going to have to give birth alone and um you know, and, and and so I started to really freak out. Uh, I was worried about me getting COVID or giving COVID to, you know, my child. It was just terrible. And mixed with that, he became incredibly aggressive around this time, like incredibly aggressive. Um, there was a time that, um, yeah, he just, yeah, he was very controlling like with what exercise I would do with what I would eat um it was pretty bad did you feel like you were his property at this point I felt like I couldn't go anywhere without him um following me shadowing me um keeping an eye on me it even got to the point when I was going to the bathroom he wanted to know how my, uh, like my, like whether I was spotting at all or, um, cause I did have that, but it was sort of like, I felt like, uh, he would stand outside the bathroom and every time I'd come out, he wanted an update. Um, I, I didn't feel human. I felt like a sort of a vessel that was carrying this child. And, um, I kind of missed out something cause I will, I do want to say as well, I have quite bad PTSD. So sometimes um, I can't remember everything in a certain orders. And I don't know whether this is just because my mind finds it easier not to remember everything in, in exactly the orders it, it, it comes in. Um, but there was quite a bad incident that happened prior to this pregnancy, um, which I should probably go back and tell. So... We had quite a, a big incident that happened again. And interesting, this also happened when we went on a trip to the mountains. Um, we we had just went, I think, for his birthday, actually. And we'd hired a cabin for a week. And uh, on the drive up there, he was acting very strangely. So this was pre, pre-COVID, way before COVID. Uh, he was acting very strangely. I didn't know quite w- what was going on. He insisted that I drove, which was strange because he always had to drive. And um, when we got to the cabin, he, he wasn't saying a word. And I, I, we'd taken my animals with us. So we had my two cats and my dog. 
and I was just excited to be in this big house. It was a big cabin. We lived, you know, we lived in a one bedroom and it was just fun having like three, four bedrooms, you know, three story house. And he just sat staring at the TV, like not saying a word. And I, I, I sort of said, listen, I'm, I'm going to go to bed. I'm not sure what's going on, but even though you're not saying anything. And, uh, he just turned on me was like it's my birthday we should be having sex I want to have sex and I just said what literally you've not said anything to me and you're you're just now demanding sex and and I said flat out no I said no I'm not just having sex with you I'm not you know I'm not just gonna give you sex because you're demanding it that's not gonna happen so we had this fight and he was really angry. He was really uh, kept, you know, driving home that it was his birthday and he should be getting sex. And I just was so disgusted. I went upstairs. There was two bedrooms upstairs and I went in the spare bedroom, I guess, the spare bedroom. And I left all my other stuff in the main bedroom that we were obviously going to share. So I just you know, went in the spare room and he comes in and for the next probably about two or three hours he went on this massive um torment it was just like torture so he would go up and down the stairs uh he grabbed some wine started chugging the wine i had to run downstairs grab the wine out of his mouth and you know um and then he decided to grab my car keys and he was going to smash my car into a wall. And again, it was my fault because I wasn't giving him sex. And then this sort of, uh, then I'd calm him down and then he would get angry again. And um, he went live on Facebook streaming me and the cabin. And he was saying to the, you know, the Facebook streaming thing or whatever it was, oh, you know, it's my birthday and my girlfriend won't have sex with me. I was absolutely mortified. And I I was hiding in the spare bedroom when he was doing this, but he kept opening the door and I shut the door and he he thought it was locked, which was weird. There was no lock on it, but he, he assumed that I'd lock the door. There was another cabin that was quite far from where we were but there were these two guys who were or I don't know there were some guys obviously drinking on the balcony or you know you could hear their voices very faintly but you could hear them and he my ex started to say that the men were in the room with me he was saying things like why are you what are you doing with those men you whore and it was so weird I didn't understand what was going on and then he admitted that he'd taken his friend who always got in these, you know, gotten steroids, which I found out he was taking about two years into our relationship. But he had also got him these Viagras from Russia and they were incredibly strong. And what I realized, you know, now was that he was, he went into psychosis. And at the time I didn't know what was going on. All I knew was that I was terrified of this person. I didn't recognize this person. And, you know, it, it up to the next level. So um, he eventually realized that he could get into the room. And this, this was going on from nine until five in the morning. So I was beyond exhausted. Um, he was, you know, he was just wired. And uh, it was just me running up and down, running away from him, him grabbing me, him screaming at me, uh, constant threats. I went back into the spare room and I, as I passed the the bathroom upstairs, I saw a, a butcher's knife. And I just, I freaked out because uh, this is not... <laughs> The, the the person that I was with was not somebody I recognized and he was so reckless and dangerous I felt I I, I was terrified I um ran downstairs and I locked myself in the only room in the house that had a lock which was the downstairs bathroom and I stayed down there for uh you know for a few hours he uh was ranting on the phone talking to people 
I don't, God knows who he was calling. Um, and then eventually it went quiet around six, six in the morning. And so I ran upstairs. Uh, I tried to get some of my things and I called the sheriff and um, the sheriffs and uh, they, they turned up and I waited outside and there was three guys that turned up and I just knew I was like, Oh, this is not gonna, this is this was a mistake. So they come, they come in and, and they've got their hands on their guns and, you know, asking me if he's in a gang um, I, because of his tattoos. And I said, no, he's not. Uh, I guess, you know, you could think that, but he's not. I didn't know what was going to happen when they went in there. Um, I did because of, you know, the, what I'd seen the night before I had, I thought, my God, if he runs down with a butcher's knife and he lunges at one of them, I don't know what he's capable of. So I, I stayed outside with my dog. I was like, you know, grabbing her. But within about 10 minutes, I just heard all the men laughing. And I just felt so humiliated and confused. So I went to the door and I just kind of listened. I stood there listening. And my ex was saying, oh, you know, when it's your birthday and... um you know, your girl won't have sex with you. And they all sort of were chiming in like, oh, yeah, I hear that, ha, ha, ha. And I just, oh, my God, it was so, I just was like, I wish they had never come. But the craziest thing was that how he was just charming them. I couldn't, I could not get over it. Like, he was this absolute crazed psychopath who was completely in what I thought was psychosis and here he was just laughing and joking with them, I guess somewhat normal. Um, so what they did was one of the guys comes out, one of the sheriffs, and he said, right, uh, whose car is it? And I said, it's mine. He was like, well, you need to leave then. So just grab your stuff and then go back. And I said, yeah, but he'll follow me. And he said, well, we can't do anything about that. Like, he, you know, he hasn't got a car. So I grabbed my stuff. I'm trying to find my two cats that like ran somewhere in the house. Um, I've got my dog, you know, and he's he's saying to me in front of the officers, oh, just just leave, you know, leave your dog with me, please. I, I don't want to be alone. And, you know, even one of them was like, oh, you know, as if I was this terrible person. Take it. I was like, no way in hell am I leaving my animals with you. So I grabbed everything. One of the guys followed me upstairs and was just standing over me, watching me as I was picking up my stuff. Like he didn't offer to help. He was just staring as gross. So I get, this, I load the car up. I drive back. Um, bear in mind, I hadn't had any sleep. I'm exhausted and I'm humiliated. When I get back to the house, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm there for about what must have been 20 minutes. Can't have been much more. Suddenly the door flies open and he's there. And he's back to the crazed person that was the night before. And he's, he's hyper. He's talking about how he got this Uber. He paid us so much money to, to fly down the freeway. And this is like a fair, this is like a two hour drive away. Okay. So this isn't like it's 10 minutes away. And I just, I was embarrassed. I thought that poor woman having to have him in the car, but also I was like, how the hell did he get there so quick? Like, so I, I said to myself, I can't be in the same place with you. You need to leave. But there was no, there was not a lot of, ras you know, you couldn't really rationalize with somebody like this in this state. Um, he was calling around people to try and go back up to stay at the the place. And I just thought, fuck it, I'm, I'm going to have to go back up. So I went back all the way the um, to the Airbnb and stayed the week there. Um and I was really ready to leave him after that. But during the week that I was away, he had literally gone on a whole, like, um, you know, he was on a mission. He'd been to all, he got, he's drafted in all his AA support. He got uh, psychiatric help that I asked him to get for years because I said, you know, I thought maybe he might be a bit depressed was uh planning his little um how to keep me 
to keep me there, basically. Apparently diagnosed with a number of different conditions, uh, psychiatric conditions over Zoom, which I find, I found very hard to believe. And I, I remember checking with my sister who used to work at a psychiatric hospital for years. Um, and she was very suspicious of the diagnosis, but I was, he even let me be his, uh, I don't know whether it was a guarantor or something. So if somebody has a, um, you know, a, a, a psychotic incident or something that the, the person, uh, I don't want to say the guarantor, but what's it, it's called when you're basically, you're next, uh, you're the one who's responsible for their care, basically. And he gave me that responsibility. And I looked over the doctor's notes, they seem to be genuine. Um, but he did mention something to me about um, basically having borderline personality disorder. And I had looked that up because I was trying to work out what was, you know, what was wrong with, I don't want to say wrong with him, but I was like, there's something definitely um, going on. Um, and it's not just him having a dry drunk. Uh, episode which he used to throw around um there was something very off with him and when he saw my reaction to that possible diagnosis he sort of changed it to bipolar and uh he said he was bipolar um so when i said i wanted to leave and this wasn't working he really dug deep and he convinced me that i shouldn't leave him because it's not right uh, to leave somebody you wouldn't leave somebody if they had cancer or they you know they were in a car crash you wouldn't just walk out on them so why would you leave somebody who was mentally not well and that really played on me because I myself has struggled with depression in the past and uh, he knew that obviously and I felt that I couldn't leave him at that point I wasn't ready to, but I also naively and hoped there was this hope that I had that, okay, maybe if we give the medication a chance, maybe that's what was missing. Maybe with the medication and his uh, therapy and his AA and his gym hours, maybe with all those things, this could work. Um, and yeah, it did. It did work for a little bit. Things seem great for a while. Um, and that's when I got pregnant again. And, and things honestly seemed uh, like really on track. And I actually, we would talk about that episode together as if, do you remember when that happened? But now look at us. Now look how great our relationship is. We've, we've worked through something and uh, we're so much stronger for it. And God, it, yeah, I, I'd convinced myself that this was this was a good thing. So back to the pregnancy. So yeah, so this time when I was pregnant, I was really happy, and he was happy. Um, but as I said, things fell apart, and um, very quickly things went very very badly. So I started getting the depression, and I was so so lost and confused and so far away from home so alienated um and i felt a, a mass a massive shame as well that i felt um that i that i was sort of feeling so depressed and i even thought about going to a bridge that's a well-known bridge where i live and i thought i'm just going to throw myself off because it's the only thing that i can do right now um it was not good. Anyway, I, I kind of carried on. I had very bad morning sickness and evening sickness. I sickness all the time. Um, but I just, I, I thought, no, I'm just going to just, just have to take each day as it comes. But then there was another incident. And I, that just was a final thing for me. And with this incident, it was, um, it was pretty bad. It was, uh, we were on the way to the beach. And this was during, again, it was during the pandemic. And um, I, he said, let's just get out of the house. You need to get out of the house. I need to get out of the house. And we ended up having an argument about his parents. 
and I was still upset that they'd let us down about the back house situation. And um, he snatched my, um, I had a sun umbrella ready for the beach and he snatched it from me and he hit the door and then he turned to me and then he went to jab me in the stomach. And I just stood there. Like I literally just stood there. I, I had no, I don't know. I was just like standing there and he just was staring at me with this face, this like horrible, nasty face. And suddenly I just grabbed my bag and I ran out the house and I ran to, and my keys were in my bag. I ran to the car and I jumped in the car. And before I knew it, he was running towards the car. I just remember seeing this like, like a pit bull running towards me, like a really like, you know, pumped up pit bull. And he just literally flies into the, my side of the door and he's hitting the door. He's trying to like jam the door open. And um, he's using his body weight every time, like it's bam, bam, bam into the side of my car. And I'm shaking and I'm trying to get my head together, but everything's happening so quickly, but also everything's in slow motion. And I'm trying to get my hands to stop shaking so I can start the car. And then he runs to the other side and I eventually start the car and I, I drive off and I'm looking around because I'm thinking he's going to follow me. And I had a previous incident where I was in my car and we both left for work and he actually tried to drive me off the road. And, and I, in my head, I'm thinking he's going to do it that, but it's going to be so much worse. So I was looking around, kind of find where he is. I didn't know where to drive. I was trying to go to different streets so he wouldn't know where I was going. And I drove really far out like two hours away and I just sat in a supermarket car park just crying my eyes out I was like I don't know what to do I don't know who to call I I I still hadn't really realized that I was in a domestic violence relationship which sounds insane but in my head I was thinking I've never like lost blood uh through any of the things and is it really that bad if he's thrown things at me or if he's like you know but I knew what happened was terrible. But in my head, I was like, it's, I hadn't put it together. So I made a really difficult decision and it wasn't an easy one. Um, but I knew that I could not have this baby because I knew that as much as I wanted to have this baby, I knew that either he was going to seriously harm me while I was pregnant or harm the baby or harm me and effectively harm the child. Um, and if I'm honest, I also thought I'm never going to get away from this guy. He's never going to leave me alone. Like this is going to be awful. So I uh, had to get an abortion. Um, I had to lie and pretend that I was spending the day with my friends when actually I went to the abortion clinic and he was always very good at knowing my every move, even though I'd like planned this out in short, well, short space of time, but I planned it out to what I thought was a convincing uh, day out. He somehow knew something was up and uh, he always had the ability to know what I was doing before I knew what I was doing, which was very unnerving. And um, after I had the operation, I was on, under anesthesia and I came out and I was obviously quite, you know, out of it. Um, and literally, as soon as I came out, he was calling me and he decided to leave work early that day to spend time with me, which he never did. And he also gave me an order for lunch. So I was, you know, coming out of anesthesia and a massive nappy on. I was, you know, bleeding and, uh, and I had to go and line up and get lunch and go back, take it. And I had to sit down and eat lunch with him. I was in so much pain. I was so 
tired and I had to give my best like performance. I had to pretend everything was fine. And I could tell he knew something was off, but I kept trying to be light and, you know, and I hadn't even had a shower. Um, I didn't know where I was going to put this nappy. It was just awful. Anyway, um, that night I, I said that I had a miscarriage and of course he went wild. Um, he went absolutely crazy. He accused me of, um, you know, what, what I did, he accused me of like having an abortion, but he was screaming at me saying, you've murdered our child, you know, you murderer. And he just, yeah, he went berserk. And I was scared. I was really scared um, that he was going to do something to me. Um, I just, I just lay there in bed. I was thinking, please don't do anything to me. Um, so he started working out of town. So he, he got another job working somewhere else. And I was really relieved because I knew that I had to get out. I knew that I had to leave because I knew that it was getting to the point where I just could sense that I was, you know, I think people on here when I hear people talk about this and it's a difficult thing to pinpoint, um, but there's a feeling that you get when you know that you could be murdered by him. And I knew that it was coming. I had a very strong sense that it was coming at some point. And, um, and I knew I had to get out. So I started to look at apartments. I started to think about how I could get out. I saved a little bit of money during the pandemic, which I squirreled away. And um, I, I tried to think about how I could get out. I'd also called up a domestic violence shelter um, and, and spoke to them on the phone a few times. And, you know, they gave me some advice, but I didn't really have much support because, again, I'm in a different country. A lot of my friends left during the pandemic and the ones that were there, you know, have their own lives. They, you know, we're still sort of isolating in a sense. Um, but I did leave. Uh, I left very quickly. I left when he was at work. Um, I had some help from some people who helped me move. And um, I didn't have long. I threw, you know, just cliche of like throwing all my stuff into trash bags and and. I was calling around shelters because I have a, two cats and a dog and I wasn't going to leave them. And one shelter said they could take two animals and me. And I just broke down because I was like, there's no way I'm doing that. I'm not leaving one of them. I'm not picking which animal I leave. It's not going to happen. So I found an Airbnb and it was the only one that I could book instantly. And I'm, it wasn't that far from where I was, but I literally it was the only thing I could get. I was was exhausted and just desperate to get out and and just leave before you know he sent something was going on and while this was all happening I was I was texting him every 10 minutes because he his paranoia had become so bad since he was working away that he demanded that I send pet messages with photos where I was of the animals what I was wearing what I was doing and so I was trying to juggle this why I had you know, people coming in, helping me move stuff. It was just a nightmare. Um, I got the animals in the car. I had all my bags and everything in the car. And I got to this Airbnb. But when I got there, there were all these like men hanging outside, like probably about 10, maybe even 15 guys. They're all drinking. They're all smoking. They're all, they're all like, um, I mean, they looked like, they looked like they were all on drugs and they were big guys. And I was like, where the hell am I? And again, I've got nowhere else to go. So I get out of the car and I quickly have a look at this place. As I'm walking into this complex, this guy comes out and he's got like a rubber band around his arm. And I'm like, oh my God, this is a halfway, this is some sort of halfway house. I was like, there's no way in hell I am staying here. Like I, this is dangerous. So I called a friend. She was like, I think maybe you should try and like stay in a, and my friend wasn't in, in the same state, by the way. And she said, maybe go to like, you're going to have to either just sneak them into a hotel or you're going to have to go and, and sit in a, a car park and, and go somewhere that's lit. 
and the realization that I was homeless suddenly sank in and that was terrifying um it, I just was like how the hell have I what I've just become homeless this is nuts it doesn't make any sense and uh I, I've had all this fear and regret I was like I could just go back what's going on but it was way beyond that I I blocked my ex who'd been calling me um so I blocked everything I blocked myself and um thank god a friend of mine called me and she said what's going on where are you um and so I went to her place thank god for her because otherwise I wouldn't have anywhere to have gone um so I stayed with her for for three nights and I managed to find a new place um and I felt like I was safe um my animals were safe I had absolutely pretty much nothing but it didn't matter because it was my own space um but unfortunately that was the <laughs> it was not a safe area um it there was a gas leak the first night in my apartment and the, the second week there was a drive-by shooting and there were a series of drive-by shootings. It was actually a gang area that I moved to, um, which was just a nightmare. Um, and uh, I was there for, well, the remainder of time that I was in that, you know, in that state. Um, but it was the ongoing violence of being in that uh, being in that neighborhood of being in that apartment mixed with the loneliness of leaving my abuser that ultimately led me to reach back out and connect with him again which was just a nightmare because for the first month um you know while I was by myself I was really good I went no contact um I I, I didn't check my blocked messages. I absolutely was really adamant. I listened to I listened to your show. I listened to um, other shows, and I was uh, I I was very proactive with getting help. Um, I, I reached out to some charities, and I uh, signed up for therapy. And um, for a while, I felt like I was doing really well. Um, but the the constant um, violence in my neighborhood uh i'd moved there at the worst time there were these two uh, gangs that were basically taking you know revenge on each other so that was just it was just constant i mean you know it was really bad um and i checked my blocked messages one day uh which i should never have done and of course i had messages from him and emails a lot of them some were apologetic, some were horrible. Um, but there was an email um, that said he had moved from our previous place. And bear in mind, the city we lived in were, is massive. Um, but he moved and he let me know that he was actually in an area or in an apartment that was just five minutes away from my place which was insane because I deliberately moved somewhere that I knew that he wouldn't move to uh, he was also working on the other side of the, the city and he hated commuting um it made no sense and I felt really betrayed I thought somebody I know has told him where I am or he has found out with some of his dodgy connections through AA I had no idea how he knew, but I knew that he 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 knew where I lived. And suddenly I felt really uh, angry. And I started acting like a nut job. I mean, I got in my car and I, I drove to that address. I like I scanned that address. I wanted to know if he was really there. Um, and I I became a bit I became nuts. I found out where he oh he told me where he worked which again was on the other side of the city and I actually drove to the location I actually watched him through the window like a crazy person and I don't I I, I can't explain what was going on I, it was just bizarre I was I was acting I was acting like the nuts one and eventually we met up uh he wanted to make amends and I was 
what I thought was I was putting up boundaries in the beginning. Um, I was very like, uh, like, you know, standoffish. We met in a neutral place in the park. He apologized and all that rubbish. Um, again, came across as really vulnerable, you know, had a whole load of, he sort of it took the stance that he was, um, he was in the wrong, but he wanted to make, you know, uh, make things right. And he understands that I never want to talk to him again. You know, he kind of took that. He's, he was very clever because I'm a bit like a cat. Like if somebody comes at me, I'll, I'll, I'll retrieve. But if somebody like l- lures me in with like little treats, <laughs> he knew how to work me, which really annoys me. Um, so, um, the only person I told was my therapist. Um, and this sort of takes me on to something else where I feel really guilty about. I became quite deceitful with my friends because I was not honest at all uh, with any, well, with any of them. There was only one friend that really knew what was going on, but I felt like with everybody else, I was really dishonest. I, I lied about the fact that I'd seen him. I, 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 kept everything completely secret and I just felt so much shame and I felt so embarrassed that after everything that had happened and the support that they'd given me once I'd left that there I was throwing it back in their faces and I was you know I'd gone back to him I was you know I'd allowed him back in my life and I was so conflicted because I felt so angry at, at that situation um yeah and I struggle with that a lot actually I think that was one of the biggest things struggling with because I don't like not being honest I, I I like telling people the truth and having to hide that was horrible um and I also got really sick around this time but I was also a little bit sick and i probably should mention that as well when I was with him and it was this weird sickness that I started to have um that I guess some people would say oh that sounds like COVID but it really wasn't um I had it way before COVID and it came back and interestingly it always come back I noticed when I would spend time with him so in the sort of post stages of me running away from him and now in this sort of new era where I was I had complete, you know, my own place. He had his own place. We wouldn't see each other every weekend. We would see each other sporadically. Um, But every time I spent more than like a few hours with him, I would get migraines. I would get the heart palpitations. Uh, In fact, I went to, I have, I had a cardiologist who actually uh, put me on the treadmill and was like, you're having heart palpitations. Are you okay? There's something we need to like look into this. Like it was, not just in my head um I was having massive like insomnia issues like you know my body was literally shutting down when I was with this person I mean it was telling me get this person away from you this is like a toxic human being and I kind of knew it and I said to him a few times I whenever I'm with you I get ill like I'm severely ill um but he was very, it was very, uh, he was very careful. He tread very, he tread very lightly around this period because he knew that any time he, he rose his, uh, raised his voice or if he just said something, I would say, okay, I want to go home now. I don't want to see you for a bit. And then I wouldn't see him for like three, you know, three or four weeks. Um, but I did find out that he was, uh, he started seeing this woman uh we had like a little fight and we didn't see each other for a few months and he started seeing this married woman with a child that he'd introduced me to you know a few years prior one of the women that he had in the wings um and I just felt this like but initially I was like okay he's moved on to someone else I can finally move on but then I felt so upset and jealous and and I missed him and I don't know I guess it's that whole trauma bonding thing it was, it really was very difficult. And the only way I describe it is I don't think I'm an addicted person. Like I can have one cigarette a week if I decide to. Um, and I've done that for a long time, or I can have one drink and that's enough. But with him, 
I was absolutely addicted. I had an addiction to this guy, like a drug addiction. And that's what I felt like. I, I felt like I was the, the sneaking and the sneakiness of my behavior, the dishonesty of not telling people the truth of who I was with. Um, it was, I was like a, I was like an addict. Absolutely. So this carried on for another two years of this, you know, on and off, on and off, on and off. And um, we finally had this very small argument, really. I mean, I'd had shingles. He decided that he didn't want to spend the weekend with me if I was in a bad mood. I mean, it was something really stupid like that. And I just, I flipped. I lost it. I kicked him out of the house. Um, I was done. And I, I, t I said, I never want to see you again. I want you out of my life. We're done. That's it. And it was the first time I really, I mean, I physically pushed him out of the apartment. I was slammed the door in his face. I, I never wanted to see the guy ever again. It just, it was something snapped for me. And I didn't see him. I didn't see him for a month or so. And I actually thought, I thought, oh my God, he's gone. He's out of my life. Um, I was also like, wow, that was kind of easy uh, because he'd always find a way to get back into my life. But this time this guy was gone. But then one morning I was in my, uh, you know, pajamas. I was like getting ready for work. I was on, the, on a phone call and he barged into my apartment. He starts ripping up my place. He was like absolutely livid. He was fuming, he was raging and uh trying to rip things off the wall and i was screaming well i wasn't screaming actually i was pretty calm i was like you need to leave because i always tried to stay calm when he was in these rages because you, you know when you're dealing well i you know you're dealing with somebody who's not all there and you never know what they're likely to do so i always tried to stay calm and he wouldn't leave my apartment so i in my head, I'm thinking, if he does anything to me, if, at least if I'm outside, somebody might see. So I run outside and he follows me. And then um, he starts picking up stuff and throwing it, plant pot, smashing it, whatever he can grab. And, and I said, you're on, I have security cameras, you're on camera. So he rips it off the wall. He smashes that, he smashes the lights. He, you know, he goes on this little rampage. So I ran back inside, I slammed the door, I locked it. And it was a pretty sturdy old door like I had all these locks on it so he's trying to kick the door in and this poor person that I'm on the phone with who I'd never spoken to before it was this woman from a water company um she was saying do you want me to call the police I'll stay on on the and I felt so embarrassed and so bad for her because she was listening to this and she's just trying to do a job and she didn't sign up for this and um, and then suddenly my window smashes, there's glass everywhere. And I'm in a studio, okay? I've got a dog and two cats and my dog was on the sofa and he smashed the window and thank God she had run. Uh, she'd obviously jumped on the bed way before he'd smashed it. Um, I was just, it could have been really bad. And um, I just couldn't believe he did it. I just thought, you know, Oh, just horrible. Such a shit. Anyway, I called the police. I, I was like, I'm going to file a report. I'm going to do everything I can. I'm not letting this guy get away with this. No, I get not, no more. This is, I'm done. So they uh, said that I can press felony charges. So we did. Um, and um, then come the messages. So then I start getting the messages from him and uh i had blocked him again although i didn't block him on facebook because i don't use facebook anymore and um i don't i really don't but um he had gone a tight on a tirade on facebook and so i um i had all these messages and they were really escalating quite quickly the first time I left him, I, I had a whole load of messages, which I mentioned, and they were, you know, some were pretty nasty. These were on another level. I mean, the stuff he was saying was so dark uh, about my family, about my nephews. 
about about the fact that I was abused and you know the stuff he was saying it was really gross I'm not even gonna say it was disgusting and I just thought to myself how could you even think that let alone say that like it is so dark uh, and of course there were you know and then come the um you know I I'm he was putting curses on me and um everywhere you go there's I'm going to be there and um my friends want to beat you up and and then the gun threats start coming in and the gun threats really scared me because he had talked about getting a gun for a while it was something that he wanted and of course I was like I don't think that's a good idea you should not get a gun but it was something that he brought up repeatedly. Now, I know probably people listening thinking, well, he wouldn't be able to get a gun because, you know, there's no way, like, legally, he could, well, he didn't need to go the legal route. This guy spent all his 20s in prison. Um, and that was something I found out later as years went on. Uh, you know, it went from selling a little bit of weed to actually he sold for some massive Mexican gang. Um, and he had spent all his twenties in prison and he actually knew the system very well. And the person that he worked for used to be in a gang and, um, only hired ex-cons. So he was around a whole load of ex-cons that were in prison for serious offenses and they all had guns, all had guns on them, all took guns to work. Uh, when the sort of job you they were doing, you don't need a gun, but they all had them. And they all would tell him, we'll just get you a gun. And first you, you can get a ghost gun, which you can just, you know, get off the internet and make yourself. And that was something that he wanted to do, but I talked him out of that. Um, so I knew that he could just borrow a gun from a friend, take a gun from a friend, he he'd already told me that, hey, what a good shot he was. He'd he uh, you know he he'd been to quite a few driving ranges. So I I, I took that really seriously, uh, and he would he would bring that up quite a lot in the messages. Um, also, he would pinpoint what I would do, so where I'd walk, the hiking I would do, where I went to work, like everything. It was all. So I, I, I became very paranoid. And when you become paranoid, it's not, it's just not fun. You know, I was, I had weapons in every part of my apartment. Um, you know, I had, I, I took gun classes. I went to the police. I told them, I showed them the messages. They told me, they told me to go and get gun training. They actually said, go and get protection. Um, so off I went to buy a gun and, um, luckily I, I didn't go through with it. I did go and get the, um, I did go and get some classes just to give me some empowerment. Um, and I probably would have got a gun had I stayed, but it was getting to the point where things were so bad and I was physically, mentally exhausted I told my family at this point and my friends what was happening. And of course, they were like, you need to leave. You need to come back to England. This isn't safe. And I knew as well, I was like, this isn't safe. I'm just staying out of like, yeah, I'm staying out of pride and not, not out of safety. And uh, I had a call from the district attorney office who let me know that the charges that were being made against him had been dropped to from felonies to misdemeanors um and again this was all for the broken window this had nothing to do with any of the abuse or anything in the past there was nothing about that it was just vandalism and trespassing um but the guy said um you know the trial that we've had the pre-trial this is the trial date oh we're going to set the trial date for this one but you will have to come you will have to sit and give evidence you will have to face them you might you will likely be cross-examined um because it's a criminal trial you will have to be there and i just decided i just can't do it anymore i just want to get on with my life and um 
I was also doing a show. I wanted to do a show at the Edinburgh Festival. I wanted to tell my story. I wanted to give myself, like, I guess the gift of, like, actually putting myself first and not him and all the, all the bullshit. So I, I, I didn't go ahead with a trial. I left. I left my life of, like, 10 years in a city that I really loved. I left my friends. Um, yeah, I think I was ready for a change, but I also felt like I had to leave. Um, so I came back to England. Uh, I took my show to the Edinburgh Festival. My show is about my story, Domestic Violence. And I told my story and I felt really empowered and I was scared. Uh, um, but I got some good reviews. I was doing well and I got back and got back to my place in London. I felt, I felt really good. Um, but then, then he found out about the show and went on a little smear campaign. So, yeah, that was not great. So my healing process has been, uh, it's very slow burn. I feel that um, I'm, I, I have good days and bad days. Some days I'm really angry at everybody. And then other days I'm, I, I look at the blue sky or I'm like really happy. Uh, it's definitely going to take me a long time to fully recover. Um, I'm very, uh, I, I've noticed that when I'm going on dates or if I'm trying to date people, um, they, I'm sort of attracting the same type of person. So there's something obviously not quite right there. Um, but I am, I am slowly getting better and yeah. And I do want to say to people like, it, it's okay to feel that shame and it's okay to feel embarrassed and all these things. And, you know, you might go back. I went back. Um, eventually, hopefully, if you're lucky enough to leave and not, you know, not be murdered, um, you know, just, just, just thank you. Thank you, lucky stars. And like, get out and, and make the most of your freedom and, and 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 is is just one person controlling you? And when you look when you look back at it, even though it's still very recent, I do think, wow, how did one person have so much control over me? That's nuts. Um, yeah. And if you had any last words of wisdom for everyone, what would they be? Definitely, if somebody shows you who they are, believe it. He told me so many things. He gave me, he gave me some real truths and I should have taken them and I should have run, but I didn't. So, uh, and also look at the company they're keeping because I definitely, some of this company weren't, they were not good people. And uh, that's definitely another thing. And you do become the people you surround yourself with. So, um, yeah have just know that you can do so much better <laughs> know that you can do so much better and that somebody much uh, nicer will be around the corner just uh, just wait for the right person do not do not fall for their bullshit well merle i want to thank you for being here with me today sharing your story scary person you were with you know it sounds like you were with uh a Rambo, I think we discussed way beforehand from the Lundy Bancroft abuser types, and uh, you're alive. You're not a statistic in that sense, and I'm happy you're here to share your story. You're going to help a lot of people by sharing your story, so just a big thank you uh, from me and everyone listening today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Merle, once again for being here. And if you want to be a guest like Merle was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com and click on the guest form button at the top of the page. And there you can read all of our instructions and please read them all and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our guest form and press the submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. 
And also at our website, we have a support group. So if you need support, we have a support group by clicking on the support group button at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Inside, you'll see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We have forum boards for you to post on to get the validation that you need from survivors just like you. It is a wonderful group of people on there, and you can make a lot of friends too. So if you need support, join our support group today. And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at DomesticShelters.org. And at DomesticShelters.org, they have all the articles and resources that you need to help you make sense of everything that you're dealing with. They have every phone number, email address, and web address for shelters and agencies. No matter how big or small the town you're in, DomesticShelters.org has it there. So if you need extra support, please do go to DomesticShelters.org. And we have other friends of the show called Shelter Movers. Everyone in Shelter Movers, it can be found at sheltermovers.com. And what they do is they help you move all of your stuff from your home into storage, and that can be your pets and livestock too. So if you're trying to get out of domestic violence, coercive control, and you need help leaving the home, getting all of your stuff out of your home and into storage, Shelter Movers can help you at sheltermovers.com. They are only available in Canada, and it is a donor-supported charitable organization. So if you need help from them or just want to donate to them, go to sheltermovers.com. And that is it for today's episode, for today's survivor story. So for myself and Merle, we hope you have a good night.